to talk with all by myself. No one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf. Hey, Miss Behaven, saving my love for you, for you, for you, for you. I know for certain the one I love. I'm through with flirting, it's you that I'm thinking of. Hey, Miss Behaven. Saving my love for you Like Jack Horner In the corner Don't go nowhere What do I care Your kisses Are worth waiting for Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth and final webinar in Sustainable Conservation Solution in our Soil Series. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'd also like to thank our generous sponsors, Environmental Science Associates, Holland and Knight, Spotswood Vineyard and Winery, and Iron Horse uh, Winery for supporting our spring 2023 webinar series and for sharing Sustainable Conservation's vision of stewarding our most precious resources in California for uh, for everybody. My name is Elliot Grant and I'm the Central Coast Project Manager at Sustainable Conservation. I work on our soil health team and focus on supporting the adoption of healthy soil practices to positively impact surface and groundwater quality and quantity. Our soil health team works with growers, researchers, and communities and regulators across the San Joaquin Valley and Central Coast of California on our toughest water issues. And for those of you who don't know, Sustainable Conservation is a California-based nonprofit that works to advance the collaborative stewardship of California's land, air, and water for the benefit of nature and people. And so, as I mentioned earlier, this is the last webinar in our four-part series. So in previous webinars, we talked about what exactly soil health means and why it's important to California. Second, when we talked about how soils and water are connected. And the third, we talked about how we can help promote soil health practices for growers through the agricultural supply chain. So if you missed any of these earlier conversations, I encourage you to check out the recordings on our YouTube channel. So today we will be rounding out the series by talking to those who work with the soils every day, the growers. But before I introduce our special guests, we'd like to get to know our audience a little bit better. So we have a few questions for you, and uh, we'd like them. We'd like you to uh, respond to them in a Zoom poll. And if you don't see your answer reflected in the answer choices, just feel free to throw it in the chat for us. And so, yeah, the first question we'd like to know is uh, where you're joining us from, and the second one is uh, what best describes your area of work, and then third is uh, how would you rate your level of experience with soil health. So we'll let uh, we'll give you all some time to respond, and then. Um, and then we can end the poll and, and see where we're landing. Just a couple more seconds here for you all. All right. So I think now that the, uh, I think we'll end the poll here. And uh, so it looks like you have a good mix of folks across um, the Bay Area, the Central Coast, the Sacramento Valley and San Joaquin Valley. And 13% uh, of us are also out of state or other. So that's great to see we have a little bit wider of coverage. And then with affiliation, we have a good amount of folks from uh, the government sector and nonprofits, also philanthropy and um, water, some water agencies as well as uh, agriculture, very interesting. And it uh, looks like we have a good mix of knowledge here. Uh, we have some about 30% beginners, 30% average, and, and some folks, you know, with some expert expertise. So really looking forward to the questions that we're going to be coming up with today. Oh, I'll share the results. Sorry about that, y'all. Now you can see them. All right, let's get started. Okay. So um, so yeah, let's get started. I'm excited to uh, introduce our uh, panelists today, uh, Katie Chiapuzio, the Director of Environmental Science and Resources at Braga Fresh, and Justin Wiley, a fifth generation farmer and partner of Wiley Farms. Welcome, Katie and Justin. 
Oh. Hey, Elliot. Hey, Hi, folks. So um, tell us both about uh, who you are and both as a person and a grower. And let's start with you, Katie. Sure. Sounds good. Yeah. So I'm the director of environmental science for Braga Fresh. Uh, Braga is a family farm out of the Soledad area, which is the Southern Salinas Valley. We also grow an Imperial. We're on our third generation of farming um, and we are 80% organic, 20% conventional on the growing side. And we're pushing into the regenerative farming space as well. Um, I'm the director of environmental science. So I was hired about four years ago to do greenhouse gas emissions data all sorts of data compliance. Um, and over the years, my role has kind of grown and expanded. And so now I do all of our on-farm trials. We do a lot of collaboration with uh, nonprofits, with universities or government agencies. And so coordinating all of that, um, I also manage an apiary on the farm. So we have about 18 active beehives that I'm managing. Um, and yeah, just getting, getting out there on the production side of things and figuring out where we can make improvements. Um, as a person, I love cooking, I love eating, I love learning, and I love going outside. So agriculture is a good fit for me, I would say. Great. How about you, Justin? Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm a fifth generation farmer. Uh, we operate out of Madera, California. So our family, we own ground in Madera, and then we also are, are ranch managers there. So about 3,500 acres we manage. I also work for an ag investment group on the side, so I'm I'm very aware of that side of things. It's it's definitely it plays a role in California agriculture. But um, as far as regenerative agriculture and organic, um, about seven eight years ago, my son was diagnosed with autism, and at the time there were a lot of issues, health issues, and uh, asthma, and a lot of sickness on his part. He was hospitalized a couple times. Uh, at the time, we were faced with the decision of of either looking at sort of an acceptance role, which a lot of people do practice in saying this is kind of the future, but it was so extreme at the time with his sleeping habits and night terrors and things like that, we decided to, to look deeper for our family. And what we discovered is that there was a connection there between his gut and his health. And then later, of course, discovered that connection that's very common in regenerative ag, that is the, the connection between the soil health and our gut health. Mm -hmm. And so, but seven, eight years ago, I hadn't made that connection yet, but we decided to go this route of just doing everything we possibly could to detox him and, and changing his diet and switching to a lot of raw things like raw milk. And, and all of a sudden there was this dichotomy for me as I'm managing thousands of acres and farming on one side, one way, and then I'm at home, I'm feeding and acting another way. And the, and the two just did not fit. So all of a sudden I started to look at that and, and discovered regenerative ag. So we've been on that path for about seven, eight years. So I still wear both hats where I, you know, I sit on boards and I, participate in the in the general farming community on the conventional side but i'm doing everything i can to spread that word to farmers to, to let them know there's another way out there and, and all the exciting things that we're seeing happening on our, our own farms and that sort of the hope uh for the future and i i think there's a lot there so wow thanks for sharing your story justin appreciate sure. that and to you too katie so um yeah but we'll go back to you justin tell us about your soil and uh, what soil health practices you're uh, implementing and just for some folks who might not be as familiar with soil health practices just quickly define what the practice is uh when you say the name or something like that okay so there's there's several and um one of the biggest things for us being in permanent crops so we mainly farm pistachios also citrus pomegranates and almonds and um, mainly we started out with the pistachios and regenerative ag as a conventional farmer for a long time, having multi multiple generations still involved in the business. Uh, I can tell you the fear is real. Um, being in that situation where you start to pull back on your inputs on your nitrate, nitrogen, starting to, you know, in, look at pests and disease as a symptom and not, not going out there immediately and trying to kill it. Um, it was very, very difficult um, from a psyche standpoint, just looking at it and making changes. But one of the first things we did in following a lot of regenerative agronomists is remove the nitrates from our trees. So looking at sap sampling, we completely eliminated nitrate nitrogen uh, applications, switched to compost and fish hydrolysate. That was a big one for us because it reduced disease and pest pressure. And then uh, really looked at getting our soils covered and started trying to figure out ways, and, and it's a lot easier, I know, in permanent crops for us, uh, where we don't need clean floors, but looking at getting our soils covered and putting a mix of, of root exudates back into our soil to try and change the, the dynamic, and I think that's had a huge effect. So those, those are two, I mean, there, there's about a dozen of them I could go into, but those are two big ones. The early start is getting the soil covered, 
And then also just for us, removing nitro nitrogen from the program and focusing more on amino type fish hydrolysate and compost were, were big for us. Wow, very cool. So you're using uh, organic amendments as fertilizers and then cover crops throughout the growing season to uh, help keep the, as you say, soil covered. Yep, so, absolutely. Nice. What about you, Katie? So yeah, tell us about your soil and what soil health practices uh, you all at Brogger are implementing. Yeah, sure. So we have a very different system than Justin has. Uh, we're doing, you know, annual crops. We're doing broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, lettuces, uh, leafy greens, a lot of leafy greens, which have a lot of rules around them. So we're not at the compost stage yet, but we're really, really hoping to get there soon. Um, we are cover cropping as well. So keeping a crop there in the winter, keeping those roots in the ground, holding on to that water, uh, getting that aeration in that soil, making sure the topsoil is not running off with irrigation and, and rain as we had this year. And then um, we also focus a lot on covering our soils. And so normally in our system, you would just have a cash crop on your bed, but we're actually putting other species within our mixes. And so um, on our regenerative plots, we have grass in between our rows of sweet baby broccoli right now. And then we also have a clover in the furrow. Uh, and that's just to keep that soil coverage, keep you know all that topsoil from burning and getting that microbial, all, mo microbial movement in there, keeping that alive. And then um, we're also focusing really big on our tillage. And so Tillage is like any large tractor going through the field, compacting your furrows and sending knives in the field. It's absolutely necessary in our form of agriculture, um, but we do believe that there's a way to minimize how we till and to disturb the soil less. So keep that soil intact. And that's something we're really working on here. So we're, we've actually been able to reduce a lot of our fields from maybe 15, 20 passes to prep the field for planting down to four or five. And so that's been really impactful. Very cool. And just so I can strike the juxtaposition, Justin, you're you're on no-till systems, right? With the permanent crops? Correct. So so in in some of the systems with almonds, so in the, especially in the regeneratively farmed blocks, um, we're not tilling. And, and there is an it is necessary every once in a while we do have L boxes, but we're gonna have ground squirrels and gophers. Mm -hmm. So at, at there is a point in which, you know, but we can do very minimal tillage in that case, and it's once right. every several years. So it's very minimal right. effect. And normally we try to time it right before the rains where we're coming back in with a cover crop. Right. So compared to the annual system, it's <laughs> almost almost, almost none. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. Um, so yeah, let's let's dive into this. So what's your lived experience with climate change? And so what has been the reality on the ground, you know, going from years of drought to uh, extreme precipitation and flooding this year? Um, and we can start with you, Katie. Yeah, sure. So um, it's it's been challenging in the Salinas Valley, as everyone probably knows. Um, we obviously got a lot of rain early season, um, all throughout the season, actually. And the timing of that really hit us hard because every time the field was about to be dry enough to get a tractor in there, get a planting in, it, it rained again. And it was just enough to saturate it to the point where we had to be pushed out another week. So it was really a stressful winter. You would think it'd be nice and calm for growers. You just get to hang out, go home early, but that's really not how it is because you're constantly worried about what your field's going to do, how the crops that are in the ground are going to react to that weather. And so those extreme events, they're really impactful for us. Um, we had a lot of acres underwater. We had some levee breakage on some of our ranches too. Um, the, the next door neighbors where our levee broke, we only got a couple acres covered, but they're acreage right now is completely covered in sand and sediment from the river. And so they're not going to be able to plant that um, changes their soil type. They have to be able to integrate that with tillage. And so there's a lot of impacts uh, that we're still seeing. We're also finding that as we get hotter, our pest season is getting a lot longer. So a lot of the pests that we would normally only see for a couple months, we're now seeing for half the year. So um, it's been really, it's been really interesting, um, but that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're trying to diversify the way that we grow so that we can, you know, try to move with climate change as it's happening and, and try to reverse it if possible too. Wow. What about you, Justin? Yeah, so definitely. Uh, increasing pest pressure, and I think that's one of the one of the differences between regenerative ag and conventional is that on that conventional side in California, especially, we're seeing, you know, of course, there's a lot of legislation coming down. There's a lot of a lot of research looking into what are the effects of some of the chemicals that we're using in conventional ag. So long term, we're not sure. We've lost quite a few tools over the last ten years where they, you know, decided that, and and rightfully so in a lot of cases that they were too toxic to the environment to to be using in our crops and our food. Um, but in it, being on that other side, it's it's a scary proposition to not know what the option is if you lose a certain tool. And, and so in pistachios in particular, 
with climate change, we're actually seeing a big increase in naval orange room pressure. So our biggest past, um, and it's a huge complaint for consumers. They see what they see as a worm in the nut. They see it as a maggot. They don't see it as a, as a moth, you know? And so um, we see that we are continually see just in a big increase in, pe in pest pressure. So that, that's the first one. The second thing is that during the drought, we had a lot of uh, salt buildup in our soils. So traditionally, an inch would, would go down about a foot. It should saturate in our sandy loam soils, an inch of water should saturate about a foot. And what we see after our rainstorms in our sandy loam soils is that we might have two to three inches because of the compaction, because of the high salt. And that's that's a very common accepted thing in conventional ag. You talk to an agronomist or an irrigation specialist, they'll say, oh, that two, three inch storm isn't gonna touch your soils. And so it's almost like we've accepted this compacted, highly compacted salted up soils. So, we saw that with our with our soils and then also just an increase in the salt loads in our soils without that leaching effect of that 12 to 15 inches of rainfall, we're continually seeing an increase in the salt. So our water quality is dropping higher bicarbonates and we're also just seeing a buildup. And that could be from even from the compost, but a buildup mm -hmm. from the, the water that we're applying, the bicarbonates in the water, sodium or, or chlorides, and also just uh, it's in the fertilizer we're using. So um, that, that's definitely an ongoing issue and getting worse. And, and that problem has been around for 75 years. I mean, right. Time, so. Wow. I mean, yeah, like so such, such a clear, you know, with the in insane rains we've had and the flooding, that's been an issue, but also the unseen consequences of drought is the salt buildup. And that's a real issue for growers like you all. So, you know, we know that weather is a variable that affects your operations and businesses year to year. And so you know, as growers, you know, Justin, you're talking about tools. And so we see these soil health practices as like tools in your toolbox. So how have you been using these practices to help adapt to climate and weather variability, you know, particularly with the water variability that we face in California? And uh, Justin, you can start with this one. Sure. Um, so back to the keeping the soils covered, I, I think for us as permanent crops, um, that that's a huge issue for us. And so we're dealing with Sigma and, and how that relates to water usage. And UC Davis proved that when you're, when you're have, when you have cover crops in your orchards uh, over the winter time, you actually are not using any more water. And so that, you know, I've personally witnessed looking at our orchards where if we take four or five days in between irrigation sets and we're pushing water down to 24 inches, 36 inches in between that four or five days, uh, we'll actually see a reverse capillary action where the top six to eight inches is pulled out and, evap and that water evaporates. So I'm making the argument to anyone that'll listen, especially regulatory boards, that it's very difficult in a permanent crop system to fast forward soil health without keeping your soils covered. Uh, but the way we're measuring it is the transpiration rates. We don't measure the, the flowing water that flows out of a perfectly clean field because the soils are compacted and taking some of the topsoil with it, that doesn't get counted in the measurement. What does get counted is the transpiration of my cover crops, our cover crops during the, the winter time. And so, you know, we're really pushing back on that, looking at that and saying, it's even if there was a little bit more water usage throughout the year in a 12 month time period, I would argue that the long-term benefits of keeping your soils completely covered as much of the year round as possible is, is a bigger benefit. And so, so we really need to take a look at that as an industry, you know, across the board in California and, and what are the benefits there? Because I know farmers are afraid. Farmers can get water credits right now from Sigma by disking their fields and keeping them fallowed. If they allow their fields to, to germinate over the wintertime and stay, they will actually lose credits from some of their local water boards. And so we need to look at that, that we're actually telling farmers, keep your ground fallowed instead of instead of green during the wintertime when it, when it should be absorbing water and, and preventing erosion and those kind of things, you know, things that we're all familiar with. We're actually moving in the wrong direction in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm, we're trying to push back there. Yeah. And so so folks who aren't familiar with Sigma, it's the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and it is... Um, it is a regulation that will manage how much water usage can be pulled out of the groundwater um, in many parts of the state. And uh, it is a very, um, it's a it's an evolving regulation and there are issues with how we are accounting with water and, you know, weighing these short-term benefits of, of, you know, weighing these short-term costs of water use versus long-term benefits like Justin's talking about of, you know, cover cropping and regenerative ag. So Katie, what about you in, the, in, in this situation and the question? 
Yeah, a little bit of like anecdotal that, that we have over here. So we started our regen journey about four years ago. And so we're not quite as far along, but um, we have one field that has been, it has not had any deep tillage in about four years. So instead of tilling up to 18 inches or two feet, we're doing like three to four inches maximum. And so that soil looks really good uh, over the winter, especially in the, in the January storms, we still had a crop in that field. So it was actually sweet baby broccoli that went to flower. And we had that grass in the, in the center of the bed. And then we had that clover in the furrow right next to that we had a big cover crop mix so it's usually like a triticale rye mix that we do and then next to that we had a fallow field and after those january storms when you drive to the bottom side of the field because it has quite a slant you could see on that first field that was fully covered with all those different root systems that not a bit of water left that field so you, instead of seeing normally what you would see is like some rutting coming from your field so you can see that besides the moisture that's already on the ground there's water flowing off of that field so there was nothing there the next one with the cover crop maybe had a little tiny bit, but the one next to that, it was just completely devastated, you know, running out of the road. Um, fortunately on that ranch, we recycle all of our water. So that wasn't going to go anywhere, but it's just one of those things where right away you're seeing the benefits of these practices. And, and a lot of people told us when we started this journey, you know, you're not going to see anything in three years because we do have a grant, you know, that is covering part of this. And it's like, we're like, well, we're going to get all this great data. And they're like, you're not going to see anything in three years. And I'm like, really? Because we actually have been seeing stuff already. And we saw it almost right away. You know, even after a cover crop, it's not very common to see earthworms in Salinas Valley ground. Uh, it's just, it's really low fertility. And we've had earthworms in a lot of our fields. So um, there's just a lot of really encouraging, you know, anecdotal data, and we're soon going to have the numbers and the qualitative and quantitative data uh, to prove that this concept is possibly scalable in our system. Wow. I love that anecdote of, you know, with soil health practices, people do say it's that long-term, you know, a, a cruel of, of game that you get, but, um, you know, the water benefits, they can really come in the short run. And I think that's, that's a great point to, to take home. So beyond, you know, producing the food and and what other issues, in addition to responding to climate variability and the inherent challenges of crop production, do you face with integrating these soil health practices? And Katie, you can start us off on this one. Yeah, that'd be great. So one thing that that's really difficult for us is this is something that we want to do. You know, farmers are the biggest advocates for their land. They understand their land more than anybody else. And it really does you know, it fluctuates a lot. So Salinas Valley, low fertility soils, but those soils can be totally different if they're only a mile away. And so the practices that you're trying to implement, it's difficult and it's really difficult to scale. And it's up to the farmer and the grower to understand what they're doing and their soils and understand their system to be able to properly apply these things. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily how regulation always kind of applies to us, right? So it's it's blanketed and it's understood and, and we understand that that's something that we have to comply with. But it is difficult sometimes, uh, mostly from buyers, I would say. I think regulatory, uh, they, they know what they're doing, but sometimes from buyers, they have these really intense um, specs that they want you to make, for example. So they want your conventional broccoli to look like your regenerative broccoli, to look like your organic broccoli. And that's just not the reality of the situation. Conventional, you have all the tools at your disposal. Uh, regenerative, you don't. And so sometimes your specs are going to be different. Maybe the crop will look a little bit different. And that flexibility in the market is really necessary necessary. Um, because I think a lot of the times uh, growers are kind of seen as, as the problem. Why aren't you harvesting that? Or why did that not make it to market? And it's like, well, we did harvest it and it did make it to market, but our regenerative broccoli might not look like our conventional broccoli based on the way that we have to grow it. Um, we've gotten rejections in market for ladybugs or lacewing larvae, which are beneficial insects. And so we're trying to get that message out there like, hey, this is proof that we're doing what we told you we're doing. And so um, just kind of that, I guess the discrepancy between the grower and the end, you know, the, the eater and the consumer and the buyer. And so getting that supply chain to really understand the whole system, I think is really important. Wow. And, and Justin, what about you? What other pressures, you know, outside of dealing with climate variability and, and uh, just the challenges of growing food are you having with, you know, increasing the adoption of soil health practices? Yeah, I think a lot of the, the studies that we follow and, and participate in, I, um, you know, there's actually a, a great com regenerative community. So, you know, Katie and I, if we started talking about who we're following and who we're listening to and some of the, the hero agronomists that are out there, I'm sure they would be most of the same people. But um, there's a really great community and a lot of the studies are done in corn and soy. That's just the majority of the acreage. So that's definitely a challenge for us in the tree crop. Like Katie said, there's there's operational challenges and in, in everything. So we we've been trying to integrate animals into our system to try. And, uh, Katie talked about low fertility soils, and I think Madero would would 
Madera would also fit that bill. And so uh, the interesting thing about conventional ag is that 25 years ago, I can look back and see records of what my dad and uncle were applying on their farms. And we're largely doing in those same conventional blocks, the exact same thing now. And, and that that is a that concept of knowing what chemicals cost or fertilizers cost 25 or 30 years ago, knowing what the, the crop price and what the economics look like in permanent crops, especially nut crops, and then looking at what they are today and what we're faced with, and especially looking at where prices are going to go, the way they've the way they've fluctuated over the last couple of years, the chaos that's out there in the market. Um, that, that gives me a lot of hope to be to be looking at regenerative ag because um I, I hope that a, a market continues to develop. There is a small market in pistachios. I know there's a more established one in almonds and citrus. But um, looking at this long term, I, it doesn't matter to me because our costs in a regenerative system for, for our orchards are actually less than our conventional systems. So I've sat down with clients and with other growers trying to convince them of this, that when you stop worrying about clean floors, when you stop when you stop spraying for every little pest that comes in, you reduce the number of passes in your orchard, um, your, your costs go down. You can actually spend more money on, on low salt, high quality miners, fertilizers that you uh, might apply as a foliar instead of having to slug on two or three times a year. So there's all these differences that the system changes. You can focus on compost teas, you can focus on compost or or soil amendments, and you have the dollars to do that. And, and still at the end of the year, you end up under budget. So I would say there are a lot of challenges from a re, from a research standpoint. Uh, you know, we're we're learning a lot of this as we go, um, but I, I do have a lot of hope. I'm um, just looking at the economics of it, looking at the challenges on on the conventional side, and how that still how that feels somewhat hopeless and difficult. Um, I think regenerative ag offers a, a whole other world here. So that is really interesting to hear. And Justin, maybe could you elaborate on like that, that journey, that interpersonal journey that you took to kind of get your buyers and the food safety specialists and your certifiers on board with you kind of taking these leaps and breaking the mold of, you know, what a normal organic or even conventional grower would look like. How did you kind of navigate that? I, I have a couple of kind of kind of funny stories about that. So years ago, we had a, a food safety person in the, in the orchard who said, you know, I'd, I'd prefer that your orchard was covered. Um, you have birds in here, you have animals, you have your neighbors are walking through on the roads and their horses. And and mind you, these are pistachios and citrus. Nothing ever touches the ground. Anything that touches the ground is, is left in the field. And so, you know, we made that argument. We started to see them get a little bit more um, just uh, oppressive in that regard, where they're, it just seemed like the wrong way to go. They wanted sterilized fields. And so at the time, farm bureaus actually got some environmental groups involved. And it was it was amazing how quickly the turnaround, the attitude went from, you know, you're going to do what we say, you're going to keep these fields clean, or we're going to write you up to, okay, let's work together. You're not, you don't have to remove your, I mean, they wanted our owl boxes gone. You know, everything that we were trying to do from an in, integrated pest management standpoint was a violation in there. And within a year or two of just meeting with, I, I'm not even sure what happened, but I know there were a lot of meetings going on in Sacramento with some of these groups. And I mean, it just completely changed. It was, a, it was a 180. So that was a fantastic development that we actually got the right people involved and, and started a conversation that changed. Um, about six months ago, I got a call from a fire marshal and she said, hey, you're in violation. You have weeds all around the outside of your orchard. You, you're, you know, you're a fire risk. And I said, I said, ma'am, that's, those aren't weeds, that's ground cover. And I said, and I said, those have been there for years and they're planning to stay there for years. And, and, you know, it's everything I'm doing. And if I, you make me remove that, I'm actually moving backwards in my program. And she said, that's really interesting. Hold on a second. And then she gets back on the phone 30 seconds later. She goes, you're fine. You won't hear from me again. <laughs> it was that quick. Just a, I, I thought, OK, this is going to be a battle. She wants me to disc my field. And so I think just having that conversation. So there's there's still some challenges, you know, some education going on there from a bureaucracy standpoint, like I talked about with Sigma. But but there, these conversations are happening. And, and I think you know, regenerative ag is out there in the mainstream, and we just need to work our way through it, like Katie said, on a on an operation by operation basis. And if I can add, I think that that the food safety, especially, I think that shift is happening in our market now, and I'm really excited to see it. Just the, you know, the the decisions in food safety being made more from a science basis and showing, yeah, we can have habitat, we can have owl boxes, and we can have bird boxes because these are all working with nature. And That's when you work with nature instead of against nature, you're actually getting more benefit. And yeah, I agree with that. And I'm excited that it worked for you. And I really hope that it's, you know, it's working for us too. So sometimes you get lucky. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think it might be important to call out the differences in these systems because, you know, with a lot of the permanent crop systems, you have a pasteurization step. And so yes. that is something that is a, a you know, assured cleaning step. But um, with Katie, you want to talk about your system a little bit just to, so folks yeah. know the... Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, specialty row crops, you're growing everything on the ground, low to the ground. Um, yeah, you're, well, we're doing soil and water testing, of course, but yeah, totally different system. Um, there's a big concern with the raw consumption of, you know, spinach, all the outbreaks that we've had. And so, you know, it got really tight really fast. We had people get sick and we don't want that to happen um, in, in the industry, not in us in particular, but that happened. And so all these regulations came down on us and, you know, everyone kind of went bare ground. You can't have habitat. You don't want to cover crop. You don't want to, you know, harbor any pest. You don't want to harbor any rodents or anything like that. And, and we've been bringing those practices onto our farm for a long time. And we don't think that they're having that negative impact. And so it's just been, yeah, it's been really in, encouraging to see that shift of, Hey, maybe you can have habitat and it's okay if there's birds around, as long as they're not these species. And Hey, maybe if we bring the native birds back, we're actually not going to have these issues because we're going to get rid of, you know, those invasive birds that cause these issues. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been really cool. Wow. And, and what do you feel like to both of you, what do you feel like the change of the tide has really been driven from, from consumer, like, you know, pressures on the supply chain, or is it from kind of growers like you all trying to really innovate and, and trying to break out of the mold of how things are done? I think for our industry, it's the collective voice. I think that as we come around and we say, hey, you know, we know what we're doing and we trust, you know, our growers and we trust our our processes, this is why. And then having a lot of the local universities back us up on that and taking up those research projects and getting the funding to prove the concepts that we all believe in, um, you know, we need the data. It's really important. So working the growers, getting in the room with the, with the academics, with the nonprofits, it's like, I really think that that's what's pushing things forward. Um, and that's what's worked really well for us personally. Love hearing about the collaborative solutions. That's that's our bread and butter. What about you, Justin? Any perspective? I Go do ahead. think the sustainability groups and you know, in combination with some of the universities, you know, they're out there and they it was great working with some of the some of the researchers at UC Davis because they feel very strongly about ground cover and you know its connection to so for permanent crops, we look at the we're look, we're watching and measuring fungal to bacteria ratios very closely. And so for a permanent crop, we're looking at say one to five, uh, one to 500 in weight in a soil, fungal to bacteria. And it really should be reversed. An old growth forest would be about a 500 to one. We'd love to be at least five to one, maybe 10 to one. And we've seen our soils go from one to 500 down to one to 50. And, and you know now we're probably at that one to 10, one to five. So we're moving in the right direction. We're really excited about seeing mushrooms sprout up in the fields. You know, I mean, you're, you're out there walking in a pistachio field and all of a sudden there's a maple growing. And so one of the concepts of this, this soil is, is, you know, that soil fast forwards, it, it germinates uh, according to where it's at on that scale. So early successional plants would be a lot of those weeds. Later successional would be more like bushes and trees. And we're seeing a lot of that. Um, and But that conversation is happening and people are watching from the universities and they're in on these conversations and they're taking this message back to some of these groups saying we have to have a conversation about this. You know, we can't be, it cannot be black and white. It can't be right. clean, sanitized fields. They need some of these tools and, and they're not perfect. Definitely we have, we have other animals in our field. You know, we have a lot of coyotes showing up all of a sudden because there's food sources for them. So, um, you know, just one more reason on, in our world to not harvest off the ground, you know, and keep the field clean. Um, but generally, food safety for us is basically very careful about what we're applying within 90 days of harvest, and we can very easily fit into that window. So we don't apply compost, we wouldn't have animals in the field within 90 days. And so that that timeline, especially when you're in the heat of summer, gives that ecosystem a chance to cycle and reduces any sort of pathogens that might be in the field. Wow. I'm just curious, what do your neighbors think for, for both of you? Oh, they think we're crazy. <laughs> but we're talking to yeah. them. I I have a neighbor from Switzerland and he's a good friend of mine and, and very opinionated, been around for 30, 40 years farming pistachios with his family. And, and now all of a sudden I'm starting to see his berms get a little dirtier, you know, mm -hmm. he's not spraying as often. And all of a sudden for the first time in 40 years, he's applying compost. Wow. I haven't said anything, but I really want to say something because he's giving me, <laughs> giving me so much. We just had a grower uh, bordering our home ranch say that they're going to plant like 30 acres of flowers for our habitat or to oh, add wow. to our habitat and for our bees. And we're like, 
Nice. Happy to, happy to see that's coming. So yeah, definitely people were like, what are you doing? I had to jump in a meeting with, with like soil health professionals and tell them that this was our plan and just pretty much had them all say like, we think you're going to fail. And I had to say, I appreciate that. I respect you. And we're going to do it anyways. (laughs) And then a month later I get an email like, Oh, you know what? We're really excited about this. We'd like to be a part of it. And I was like, thank you. We appreciate it. You know? So it's definitely, people are like, we don't know what you're trying to do, but it seems like it might work. Uh, and you guys are the ones that are failing forward. So maybe we can just learn from that and fail a little less. So we're happy to do it. Wow. Wow. And, I, and Elliot, I, I haven't made this point yet, but I, I do farm and manage a lot of conventional acres and, and a bunch of different crops. And from a bird's eye standpoint, there are a lot of issues. So I'll give you one example. Currently, Please. we're having the worst thrip year in the citrus industry in California in the history of citrus. Um, lemon um, crops like lemons that maybe you might spray once later in the season have have damage from top to bottom. Um, so not only do we have very extreme fruit drop where we lost a lot of the crop, and there's a lot of theories about there about in relation to the wet year and why that is. We just had this this just I mean unstoppable amount of threat pressure that we've never seen before, and and it just continually came and so you would be they, these conventional growers would be in there treating a field and two days later it's full of thrip and at, at a certain stage and such as very early on a thrip can do a lot of damage because it's very small itself but any little damage on a tiny little piece of citrus that's just coming out of the flower stage is going to look like a huge scar on the side of the fruit by the time it sizes and so they're very susceptible early on and so what we're seeing out in the field i was in some fields yesterday and it's just it's a bloodbath and it's um you know and that's from so the argument here that conventional ag has it all figured out that there's a system out here that works perfectly it's just not true and i get that question a lot well what's your production like you know what is your what do the economics look like and i would argue what do your economics look like you know if you take a 10 year period what does your production look like and what do your economics look like and and that goes for almonds we're have you know um whether that's hail damage or weather and some of that's not stoppable with with regenerative ag but i do think right. resiliency comes with regenerative ag we some and some really exciting results just resisting some of the weather, whether that be drought, hail, um, you know. So I, I think um, we need to look at that big picture and just compare because a lot of people look at conventional ag and say, well, there's a system over here and it works. And, and I'm, I'm here to argue that, that in a lot of cases it doesn't. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. So let, let's, let's move on to the next question. So, you know, considering the you know, how these practices can really add to that resiliency that you're talking about, Justin, you know, both in the lens of pest pressure, but also in the lens of water scarcity and, you know, short-term water abundance, like with flooding, you know, what are some areas or challenges that you're really excited about working on the next few years? Like, what are you something that you're really trying to adapt and, and tackle to really kind of get to that next level that you see for either of your respective systems? And, and Justin, we can start with you and then go to Katie. Sure. So the anecdotally, and then also the research, when we're looking at soil structure, we're looking at um, nutrient cycling. So we found that that our soils are basically devoid of a certain type of microbiology. A good example is a protozoa. We've tested a dozen different ranches around Madeira, and we have no protozoa. Now, whether they were there natively, we, we have to assume they were, but they're basically our cyclers. So when we apply any form of nitrate nitrogen, a certain amount of that, nit- that nitrogen is going to be taken up by the bacteria. Um, we, we also have just a lack of microbiology in the soils, but we also have that lack of cycling. So we're missing beneficial nematodes, for instance, we're missing those protozoa. And so what we're doing is just reintroducing a lot of the soil food web back into our soils. The difficult part of this is we have high salt. Like I mentioned, we have very compacted soils. Our soils aren't respirating, they're not breathing. So it's gonna be difficult for a lot of the beneficials in our soils to live. And we see that where we'll apply a compost tea, we get a response, maybe a few months later, it's it's a lot of that biology might be might be um, dead. And, and a lot of the bugs in a jug, the, the sellers of these fertilizers will tell you, oh, maybe it lasts two weeks in the soil. So maybe you get a response from whatever it is you're trying to do it doesn't last very long. It's a very expensive proposition. So what I'm very excited about is is improving the soil structure, and that's going to come from soil organic matter getting above 3%. And we've been seeing about a half a percent to 1% every year. Yeah, I'm working with a company called Myland that actually applies microalgae into your fields, and it's a fantastic system that actually takes the beneficials 
uh, non-filamentous um, native microalgae and puts it back into your soils to try and feed all of the all of the microbiology that's already there. So when we can get above three percent in our soils, I believe that's when the magic is going to start happening. And I can tell you that there are no soils in Madeira that are above three percent other than the fence lines. And so that that's what I'm really excited about in the next couple of years. If we can get above that three percent, start to see respiration and some of those cycles returning the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle come back to our soils. Wow. Wow. Very fascinating. What about you, Katie? Where's your pie in the sky and where are you trying to work on the next few? Honestly, I think, I think we're, we're heading the same place. So we're really focusing on fertility of our soils and, and healthy soils, but we're doing it by kind of moving away as much as we can from the NPK system, you know, from those heavy nitrogen fertilizers and moving more into spoon feeding our plants what they need. And so, uh, we've been using sap analysis, which is new to us. Uh, it's not a new practice, but it's when you take a sample of your old leaf, as well as your new leaf, and then you test it for the nutrients in the old and the new, and and then you see where they're moving. And so not only can you see what nutrients are in your plant, but you can see if they're available based on where they are in the plant and you can see what you need to add. And so instead of just focusing on nitrogen and phosphorus, we're focusing on calcium and boron and whatever else our plant needs. And then as that plant gains health, you know, it's going to cycle with the soil and we're going to hopefully also build our soil health and what that's going to do for us we're hoping and and we're starting to see is really really knock down our pest and disease pressure because if you can get a healthier plant that's that's using more photosynthesis and actually maximizing its photosynthetic abilities you can end up with a plant that's going to have high bricks which is something used a lot in vineyards and something we're starting to look at in vegetables and with high bricks you get an impalatable plant to a lot of pests so like aphid for example can't eat eat plants that are high enough in bricks, like a six or something. And so as we try to lift those bricks up, which we have done successfully, we're kind of fluctuating right now, but we were getting plants up to bricks around 12. And so with 12 in your bricks, you're not going to get pests eating those plants and you're hopefully going to fend off disease better, just get a more resilient plant. And so to see these ideas that are kind of more biological uh, rather than chemical, you know, kind of just making that shift to a more holistic approach. It's been really fun. I see bricks in the comments. I'm just going to say bricks it's used in, it's used in wine. It's pretty much like the sugar level of your plant. So if your plant gets high enough in a sugar level, it's no longer palatable to a lot of insects because they can't digest it. And have you found that that is, because you all grow like 10 to, you know, 15 different types of leafy yeah. greens and coal crops. Have you found that's consistent throughout those annual products or? So we're, we're testing all of it. So yeah, we're using our sap analysis. We're using our bricks meters on everything. Um, and some of them are going to be easier to, to raise than others and, and seasonality is impacting it a lot too. So, um, we're kind of new to that. So it's been only about a year that we've been focusing on that. And so we're just, we're just learning our way, but, um, for the most part, you can kind of, you can kind of blanket some things to all of our crops but um, when you really look down into it our different soil types our different crop types it's all pretty darn unique wow yeah. all right well yeah go for it just, and i was just going to echo that and just from a nutritional standpoint what katie's talking about so we're, we're using saps have been using saps for about five years and we have a lot of insight that for the last 25 years there were certain things that were missing in our programs we were too focused on npk and not not focused enough on some of the miners um, you know, so for instance, in nut crops, boron, especially, we would apply boron early. Um, boron is required just from in the pistachio to push sugars into the fruit, get the rachises to release the nuts so that when we go to shake and harvest, those nuts release. And over the last couple of years, it's been interesting to see in our industry, a lot of farmers have had problems. And I think as our organic matter continues to decrease, our soils are less capable of buffering some of the practices we're, we're doing. And we're starting to see new issues that we haven't seen in 30 and 40 years. And so what we found in sap sampling is that right around the end of August, when our, our crops started to, to mature and they were ready to be harvested, our boron tanked. And in a lot of cases, what was left on the on the tree were, were rachises that hadn't released those nuts. So there's little things like that in sap sampling that are really exciting that, you know, when you're, you're measuring and you're looking at it, but every crop is different. And so, you know, dealing with a nutritional profile, you can be on the same ground, you're completely different issues. So let's take some uh, audience questions. And so um, the first one, let's talk about that transition, moving away from the conventional or even standard organic practices into this uh, kind of soil health regenerative uh, approach. And so um, 
yeah, this person would like to know kind of more specifics on the barriers to adoptions, you know, what sources of information you looked at, economics. Um, you know, this this could be a webinar in itself, but uh, maybe, yeah, just throw a couple of highlights that um, you found from your transitions. And uh, Justin, you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, I mentioned the probably the people that we share. If, if we're talking about sources, I would look, some of my favorite sources are the podcasts because they bring, they're bringing on the researchers talking about what they're doing currently. And, and I would, I would say the top two for me are John Kim's podcast. And then, and then Graham Sait is the second one, um, Nutrition Farming. Um, he's fantastic. So both of those guys are, are bringing on and, and every, you know, they're also interviewing, they're also talking about their own research, and then you can actually find webinars. The third one would be Elaine Ingham and and her um, soul succession stuff, and she's been around for a lot longer than anyone else. I think 40 years, she's been she's been speaking to groups where they laughed her off the stage at some point in the 70s and 80s, and now she's considered wow. kind of the, you know, one of the one of the premieres, so. Wow. Um, and Justin, do you mind uh, typing those in the chat? Um, if sure, you get a chance no to do that. Yeah, and Katie, yeah. do you want to talk about your transition or should, or uh, do you want to move on to a different one? What do you feel? No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so so we've been growing conventional and organic for a long time. And so that's, you know, two systems that we're familiar with and and we feel we do very well. Um, we we supply great product and we supply a lot of it. Um, but really for us, it was it there was a couple different things. So, you know, as Justin said, there's issues in all of these systems. There are different pressures, there are similar pressures, there's pests, there's disease disease, there's climate. And so these things are, you know, not really avoidable at this point in any of these systems. Sure, you can control them differently, but from an economic standpoint, it's really important to understand how to diversify what you're doing, because how are you going to be sustainable in 15 years if the climate, whether it be regulatory or physical, is completely different than it is now? And so, you know, we have the fourth generation up and running, kind of trying to learn their way into farming, and, and we want to continue to farm into further generations. So really important for us to, um, yeah, just move forward in that way. Wow. Very interesting. So our next question um, is about fertilizer and how it's sourced. And so um, it, this person is wondering, uh, is there a place for commercially manufactured fertilizers going forward, like the hydrocarbon petroleum-based fuels? Um, and or is it time to move on and transition away from a commercially manufactured uh, fertilizers? What's your perspective on that? So moving to more maybe organic derived you know, fertility regimes. And, and whoever would like to answer that, go for it. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so that is still the main system. And, and there's, um, there's a very interesting system from these chemical companies where they're actually financing their um, reserves and so whatever they have in stock. And so there's a whole economic system that is very difficult for these chemical companies right now because of just the, the volatility in the market and how they're having to hold it and make plans for the following year. And, and those, those volatility in prices is, is really hurting them. It can help and hurt them. So I think the chemical companies would be open to a conversation on more local and sustainable sources. Um, I know of a, a group that's just getting started. There's a few of them now, but there's a group that's just getting started in California. I'm excited about that. They're, they're taking cow manure and they're fermenting it. It's a 30 day process. They're actually producing methane as an energy source that the dairies would use, the, but they're also taking the, the leftovers from that and it's a, they can either liquefy it or whatever, but it's a, it's basically a fermented manure nitrogen product. So fully sustainable, bringing it in and it's local. And so we would, so I'm hoping that, that these kinds of groups pop up and they, they solve these problems for us because I don't like the volatility either. I don't like watching uh, potassium go from 200 to $600 a ton or UN32 go from 200 to $800 a ton within, within six months. So the volatility is really hard for farmers on the conventional side. And then definitely from a regenerative standpoint, like Katie mentioned, we're trying to get away from those sources. And that's the light at the end of the tunnel for me is ideally in a regenerative system over five to 10 years, especially when that soil organic matter increases, we should be able to pull back on a lot of our inputs. And I, I think we're, one of the things John Kim talks about is looking at your subsoils and looking at what's actually there and available. And there are some subsoils that may not have, for instance, zinc, or might be light on a potassium. And you can identify those deficiencies in your soils and know that either through compost or even just foliars, you're going to be adding that into your system for a long time, but you can reduce or eliminate a lot of the biggest inputs, uh, especially that MPK stuff where we spend a lot of money. And uh, I think that's a light of the end of the tunnel for regenerative ag is changing the system. And so that those same inputs that my dad and uncle were using 30 years ago, you know, maybe I won't be using it all 
uh, in five years or more. So, wow. Yeah, I have a, I, so I, another audience question is um, about native plants. And uh, so are there any particular California natives that you find helpful in um, developing your soil biology? Hmm. Katie, you want to try take a first pass at this one? So we haven't really studied our natives with our soil biology, but we use natives a lot on our on our property. And so we have flower strips on the sides and the, the edges of our border or our, the borders of our fields. We also have like, you know, acres committed to native and um, other flowers. And so we work usually just with like L.A. Herd or whoever does our seed. And we work with them to come up with a mix that, hey, we want to bring pollinators in. We want to support our existing pollinators and our honeybees as well. And we want to make sure that these are going to, you know, harbor beneficial insects and not pests. And so we usually work with them and they're really helpful in that. But uh, we use a lot of California poppy. We use a lot of alyssum in our fields and cilantro as well. So we 3% of all of our transplants are going to be alyssum and cilantro in that field. And that's to make sure that we can bring beneficials and surfeit fly larvae and ladybug larvae and keep them in the field, give them that habitat, give them that forage so that they can go out and eat our aphid for us so that we don't have to apply anything. Um, so, so mostly our habitat is on the side of I guess, plant health. But as we do that, and as we turn toward habitat and relying on habitat to bring those beneficial insects in, we're also reducing our inputs, which is then improving soil health in my, in my opinion. What about you, Justin? Have you seen any correlation between native plants and soil biology? We're, we're putting in a lot of white clover um, and we use a lot of, a lot of grasses. Uh, we're applying mix and grasses. What we're finding is some of the nut grasses, which from a conventional farming standpoint, they would go, you're going to allow nut grass to grow in your orchard on purpose. But, but what we're finding in the nut crops is so pistachios require a lot of water during nut fill. So you have a combination of it being very hot, a, a high water requirement for the trees and a lot of shade out because the trees are full, the full canopy of the tree is there at that point in this July and August. So we're going, we're actually waiting on nut fill to start any day in a pistachio. So that's coming, but um, during that time, so you're, what you're doing is you're applying more water through your irrigation system, but you also have full shade out. It's very, very difficult for ground cover to survive. So what we found is some of the nut grasses actually do fine in that full shade out, um, they can survive. And whereas some of the clovers and some of the other rye grasses and whatever that we'll actually put in the in the fields on purpose will die back during that time. And so your, your ground is still covered, but it's a dead cover crop instead of instead of something live pumping those root exudates into the soil. So we're still working on that. We're, we're just relying on whatever actually grows naturally a lot of cases, and then we're applying those cover crops with the compost. So this, this uh, spring, we actually put a mix of eight different legumes in with our compost at about, about 10 pounds an acre, so not a lot, but it, it was actually applied right to the berm. So we wanna see what naturally grows. So we're still experimenting a lot with that, but mainly what we're focused on is the white clover and the grasses, so. Nice, very cool. So we have time for about two questions each. And so, or yeah, two questions in general. And so this one's for Katie. So what kind of equipment and management hurdles have you experienced and how did you overcome them? Um, well, so we, when we started our regen journey in specific, we uh, wanted equipment that could strip till, right? So right. we don't own a strip tiller. It's not super common for us. And so we borrowed one from UC Davis uh, from, I think it was from Jeff Mitchell up there. And uh, yeah, so we borrowed this strip tiller and it was great and it was cool. And so we were saying, okay, we need to buy one of these. And ownership said, uh, no, we're not doing that. We have tons and tons of tractors. We have tons and tons of implements. Make do with what you have. And so uh, we we did actually. So we we started using the tools that we already had, and we're just modifying them. So um, like Justin said earlier, we have found so far, and we're hoping to prove this with data by the end of uh, this three year project that we have. But we're we're proving so far that it's actually been cheaper for us to grow regeneratively because we're using less diesel in these tractors. We're using less passes. So we're, we're consuming a lot less diesel, but um, yeah. And then we're, we're using less inputs too, but for the equipment, we took what we had, we pulled the shanks up. So we made sure that, you know, instead of tilling, like I said, 18 inches, we're tilling six inches. So wow. we have just these smaller knives raised to the highest level. And then we're also just taking knives out where we don't need them. So instead of ripping the whole field, we're only ripping a seed line. We're only ripping where we need to put that next crop in. So we're planting into some debris. So um, that's been kind of a really interesting way in which, you know, it, it was a big hurdle. Equipment is expensive and uh, 
uh, when you're saying, hey, we're going to try this new farming tactic, but we don't have proof that it's going to work, your ownership is not really going to say, oh, that's great. Let me buy you a really expensive implement. So um, yeah, we've been encouraging other people, hey, look at what you have before you try to go out there and buy new. Love it. And then one last question, and this one's for Justin, and we have a couple more minutes. So let's try and uh, this is a big question, but let's try and be quick. Um, how has your soil organic matter changed um, before and after regenerative practices? And so um, like, what's the timeline and then how many practices and how many years of those practices? Yeah, so so some of the first fields are about, this is our fifth season into it, into fully regenerative with ground cover. And uh, it was very slow at first. And I think that has everything to do with the salt load. When you have tightly compacted soils with high salts, it's going to be it's going to be suppressive. And so Katie mentioned wanting to see the fertility of her soils increase. And that's definitely one of our goals, too. We would love to see the cation exchange capacity of our soils, basically the ability of the soil to hold nutrients. Um, but what we have seen very early on as the solar organic matter is slowly increasing over the five years. So I think we just got over, over one and a, maybe one and a half percent. I'm hoping at the end of this year, we'll be pushing 2%. So we're not at that 3% yet, but it didn't move for the first couple of years. But what we did see was a reduction in salts. Wow. And so, um, as that soil structure starts to come back, you will start to see the health and you start to see the, the different types of plants that are, that are germinating. And so a lot is happening, even though it doesn't look like it on paper. Right. So wow. that's the key there. But I wanted to mention one other thing, the, yeah. Um, one of the, the plants that I found really useful is, is yellow mustard. It's a biofume. Again, it's very common in the regenerative world to talk about bio mustard, but if you're not familiar with it, I think it's a very, very powerful tool for gardeners, for farmers. We, we came into a couple of fields, we were going to transition into regenerative and we planted 1% yellow mustard. It looked like it was, it was a hundred percent yellow mustard. And that's part of that argument that Elaine Ingham makes that your soil has something like 22,000 seeds per square foot in the seed bank and it's going to germinate what it needs. And there's a whole argument, there's a lot of books out there talking about historically what weeds will germinate. And we found in some of our cover crops when we included any brassicas, any mustard at all as a biofumigant, they completely took over it and they grew, you know, like shoulder height, like six feet tall. And and then the next year we included it in our in those same mixes and, and you couldn't find it. And so it, we have all these examples like that of where you're applying a mix with as much seed you know, variety and seed as possible, and the soil will actually do the rest from there. And I and I think mustard is a very powerful biofuel again to try and and just clean up soils that are compacted, that are maybe disease prone. Um, you know, the same things being farmed over and over. So wow, great, love to hear it. So um, you know, to wrap it up, a lot of people in this webinar care about food and how it's produced. So. What's one thing you hope that these folks walk away with today? And uh, Katie, why don't you start us off and then we can go to Justin. So I think the big theme for me is really collaboration. And I think that it's really important, like I said, to get everybody in the room. Um, you know, whether you shop at a farmer's market or, or go to Walmart for your produce, like we need to know where it's coming from. We need to know how it's grown. And all those folks growing all of that produce need to really be in one space. So the little guys and the big guys can work together uh, and share what we know. And, and I think we've been really open to that. So just keep that going and, and make sure that everyone respects everyone's point of view and where they're coming from and bringing what they're bringing to the table. And um, I think we can move forward pretty fast. Love it. Justin, what about you? I would say that there is very, very quick change coming. And I see it across the board, whether you're talking about investment groups or small family farmers, everyone has heard of what we're doing, understands regenerative ag. They're, everyone's looking at it. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's going to be different for every operation. But it's going to be uh, it's being adopted very widely. And there's a lot of farmers out there that are being we've relied on the changes in our industry for in permanent crops, at least looking at from table grapes to cherries, stone fruit, walnuts, pistachios, almonds. We've looked at variety changes over the last 40, 50 years. If, if there's a problem, we go to a new rootstock, we go to a new variety. I think we're coming to the end of that. There are still new varieties coming down the pipeline, but I think we are not able to solve the problems that we have with, with new varieties and new rootstocks completely. And so there's a huge amount of issues there in the conventional side that can be solved by regenerative ag. And so we just need to have an open conversation that conventional ag doesn't have all the answers. And that even though there is inherent risk in regenerative ag, there's the, the benefits outweigh the risk. We just need to figure out a way to, to you know, balance that out. And I, and I know it's scary. I've been there. Um, mm -hmm. but it, but seeing the difference and, and working and being on both sides, I mean, it, it's night and day and just the hope I have for, for regenerative farmers. So. Wow. 
Love it. It's so inspiring for you too. I, I really appreciate it. So we are a little bit over time, so I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you to Katie and Justin for joining us and sharing your deep expertise. And thank you everyone who tuned in. Um, we really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you did too. So we'll be taking the next few months off from webinars to plan our fall series, but please find us on social media or subscribe to our emails to stay updated on our work. Um, please also uh, consider a donation by scanning that QR code on your screen. These webinars, as well as our great program work, are all funded by people like you. So, um, And also, all donations are currently being matched. So thank you again so much for joining us. And thank you again to Katie and Justin. That was a really wonderful uh, webinar. I really appreciate it. And we hope to see you in our uh, fall series. Thanks, Thanks for having folks. us. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it.